When the early European explorer William Collins arrived here in the year 1804, he said, the beauty of this spot is probably not surpassed in the world. Now, that's a pretty big claim, given how many other lovely places there are. But the locals would agree they're very proud of their little patch of northern Tasmania. Let's see what else it's got to offer. So which part of Tassie am I in? Launceston. Starting at Cataract Gorge and finishing at the city centre. We found them right here. I'll talk age-old rivalries and modern archaeology with a local dignitary. Well, that's a good archaeological clue, isn't it? Shall we take our cause to the people? Yeah! I'll incite the masses to throw off the shackles of their colonial history. No more transportation! Do you know what a silver city writing tablet is? I have no idea. And reveal the true identity of a Launceston icon. You're still having a clue, have you? Let's get things rolling just west of the city centre at Cataract Gorge. Actually, William Collins wasn't the first to twig to this lovely piece of real estate. For thousands of years, the local indigenous people came here to swap news, make merry and find some tucker. What have we got? Tony, this is called Lamandra longifolia. Yeah. I'm going to pull a piece up to give you a try of it. And you can tell me what sort of vegetable it tastes like. You'll have to tell me. Oh, well, broad bean and peas. Oh, so, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, no, I absolutely see what you mean, yeah. So green pea plant is what we call it. And usually that's the start of children foraging when they have a taste they want more. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, you could eat this. What else have we yeah. got? OK, so there's wattle trees that are growing either side of this path. Uh, what might you find in a wattle tree? Well, you usually find a, a lovely grub which eats its way up through the tree. Yeah. Um, there's a, a log here, so we might just have a little hunt around. Oh. You got one? I've got one. It's only a little one. Hey. It's very active. Look at this little fella. Imagine it's like a sausage with the skin on the outside and yummy flavour on the inside. It does <laughs> feel a bit like a sausage. <laughs> I've actually um, found one the last time I was here, Tony, and, yeah. and I actually got my mother to cook it for us this morning. She cooks them, um, and I want you to just pull it apart. It's funny, I'll... isn't it? There's no reason why I should be freaked by this at all. This is purely cultural, but it's a... the thought of it just does make me feel... Oh! Yeah, oh. just eat a little piece, chew it off and chew it. What does it taste like? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> 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 My whole brain has switched off. Um, it's a bit nutty, isn't it's it? It's a nutty flavour. Yeah. It's really quite nice. When it's first cooked and warm, Tony, it's cooled off a little bit. There's no reason why I shouldn't eat this, like, a chocolate bar, but I've got an overwhelming desire to spit it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> if I say cut, they'll never know that I've gobbed it out, will they? Cut. <laughs> 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 Actually, the residual taste is quite nice. It's like a hazelnut. You're very brave for doing that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, I'll never you. forget the little grub as long as I live. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye, Tony. Well, may you laugh. But growing up in London's East End, we didn't take eating grub so literally. Strolling by grand rivers. Now, that's much more my style. This was why Launceston was built here, the River Tamar which, along with its two tributaries, the North and South Esk, provided all the drinking water you could want, plus a sea highway out to the rest of Australia. It was a free town, an entrepreneur's paradise, with ships coming from as far away as California, Rio de Janeiro, even China, laden with new goods and going back brimful with wool. It would have been a really exciting place to live, not least, for the wheeler dealers who wanted to make their fortune out there, beyond Bass Strait. And they didn't come any wheelier or dealier than these two. John Batman, founding father of Melbourne. 
and his arch rival, John Pascoe Faulkner. John Faulkner was a convict and the son of a convict, and he was a really dodgy bloke. He decided he wanted to stake a claim to some land up north near where Melbourne is today. And in 1835, he got himself a ship, the Enterprise, and off he went. Well, no, actually, he didn't go off straight away because he was up on an assault charge and they yanked him off and told him he had to wait for a couple of months till a judge arrived. The judge did and he sorted it all out and this time he was all ready to go. But no, he couldn't leave because he also had an incredible number of debts and the local sheriff said, listen, Sunshine, unless you sort those out, you're going to have to stay here. And Fortner said, yeah, I apologise, I know I'm in debt. I will sort it out. I'll just leave you a bond, if I may, for a bit, because I've got to load some horses uh, into the ship and then I'll be right back. OK, you can come on now, because, as you can imagine, this time he disappeared out of Launceston Harbour and wasn't seen again for ages. Time for a boat trip, I think, don't you? <laughs> But like my trip today, Faulkner's was a short one. When the captain found out about his shonky runaway passenger, it was hard about and back to Lonnie. Faulkner's already dodgy reputation was looking right shaky. He said, look, this will be so humiliating for me. Would it be all right if we pretend the reason we've got to go back is because I've been so sick? And the captain said, yeah, all right. So he then pretended to be seasick for the next few days. <laughs> Tracking over the <laughs> side. And when he got back, he had to sort it all out. And ironically, went on to be a member of parliament. Whereas Batman, who founded Melbourne, died of syphilis a few years later. Life isn't always fair, is it? <laughs> Time to leave the Tamar. I'm heading across town to the site of a historical meeting of flanneled fools. The Northern Tasmania Cricket Association Oval. Get in, get in. Go on, Ethan. I want to take you back to the year 1851 because the very first match between two Australian colonies was, in fact, between Victoria and Tasmania, and it took place right here in Launceston. Apparently, it was highly successful, and it was conducted in a good spirit, and Tasmania won by three wickets. But this story is more than just a piece of sporting memorabilia. <laughs> the reason that I find that story so fascinating is because it epitomises for me a time when Tasmania was the senior colony and Launceston was the senior town compared with the fledgling Victoria and Melbourne. But that was in 1851. Pretty soon the gold rush started and suddenly Melbourne was the economic powerhouse south of the equator and Launceston's star waned. But that doesn't mean there isn't plenty of stonking good history here right now, as you're about to see. City Park on Cimitier Street is typical of Grand Parks the world over. It's a throwback to the grounds of the great English country estates. And like all of them too, it's full of fantasy, including these unusual residents. How many can you see? You can see 14, can you? They're called macaques or snow monkeys because normally they live in a snowy country. So what, you might ask, are monkeys that live in a snowy country doing here? 
Well, they come from Aikida. You can see 16 now, can you? Come from Aikida in Japan. Aikida is the sister city of Launceston. And they were swapped for a load of wallabies which have gone to Aikida. So there's probably a load of wallabies right now in Aikida Zoo with little blue noses shivering, their little hands in their little pouches. I don't know, maybe they're happy. Now that they've bridged the international divide, it would be nice if these furry little ambassadors could do their bit for local relations. And yes, I'm talking about you, Hobart. Here's a conundrum. Tasmania's got a relatively small population, and you would have thought that its two major towns would have constantly banded together in order to make things better for the majority of its population. Has that been the case, by and large, historically? No, it hasn't. Why not? Well, if anyone can answer that question for me, it's got to be the Mayor of Launceston. Albert, this is true, isn't it? There has been animosity between the two towns, really, since the colony started. Certainly, there has been a lot of animosity, and it all started, really, when the, there was two lieutenant governors in this island, in this state, one in the north, one in the south. And what happened? They disputed, obviously, the one in the south, and Lieutenant Collins decided he was for all Tasmania, but the Lieutenant Patterson up here didn't want a bar of that, so they started this great dispute. And then, obviously, the Lieutenant King from New South Wales, because they both reported to him, had to sort that issue out, and he divided Tasmania at the 42nd parallel and said there's two divisions. This rivalry remained so strong that back in the 50s, Launceston and Hobart City Councils decided to ceremonially bury the hatchet. Two shiny gold ones were buried in Brisbane Street and promptly forgotten about until a couple of years ago when Albert and his southern counterpart decided to renew their vows. This is Luke, who's looking after them, the custodian of the hatchets for us. These are actually them. They're not in bad nick, are they? Yeah. Where precisely was it that you found them? Uh, right, well, we had to move some tiles just from this area here. Yeah. So we we'll have a look around here, and you can actually see how the tiles haven't been quite put back together properly. So whole area around here was dug up and one was close to the surface and the other one was a bit further down. Oh yeah, that's a good archaeological clue, isn't it? it is, this it is. one ought to be there. Correct. Because you can see the bits of the two there and they've put them back wrong. And these are... The hatchets. The hatchets. But the million dollar question is, what is the relationship like now between you and Hobart? It's growing. We're learning to work together. We're like kids, we've got to start to do things slowly. I'm sure there are going to be issues that are going to divide us, but we are really determined to have a go at this. But you'd rather I supported the Hawks? Oh, we'd, we'd like all Tasmanians to support the Hawks, because <laughs> they're a great team and, <laughs> and great for our community. <laughs> I don't think it's quite there yet, do you? <laughs> Cheers, mate. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. I'm not normally one for name dropping, but so far on this walk, I've dined with Patsy, Ride Ruth on the Tamar and talk diplomacy with the mayor. And now I'm off to William Street to see the wizard. I know Australians have got a lot of word for a pub, boozer or rubbery or whatever, but I've never heard one called that before. And just to be clear, I'm here for purely historic reasons, all right? Hi, guys. Hi, All right, thank you. Uh, pint of wizards, please. Pint of wizard? No worries. Uh, pint of wizard, you might be asking, what's that? Well, this is James Bogue's brewery, and you've got Light Ale, Triple X, Draft, and Wizard Smiths. Brett, tell me about Wizard Smith. Well, Wizard Smith, he was a bit of a hero here of the brewery. Uh, back in 1929, we had our worst floods here on record. That was a major flood, wasn't That's it? I right. mean, you had people died, loads of houses swept away. Wizard was responsible for the horses at the brewery, yeah, yeah. so he could see the floodwaters rising, heading towards his house. Which meant that his horses could drown. Absolutely. So he didn't really worry about his own property. He jumped on his push bike, pedalled in as far as he could get, uh, swam the last little stretch, and by the time he got to the stables, the horses were up to their necks. So uh, Wizard has actually swum in, swum them out of the brewery, and, 
and up the hill to, to higher ground. And rescued the horses? Yeah. That's fantastic. And it was worth his while, actually, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. Well, James Bogue III, who was the boss at the time, uh, actually gave Wizard a job for life. He could never be sacked. Well, good for him. A job for life? I mean, that would have been fantastic, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think a toast is in order. Will you join in this toast, ladies and gentlemen? To the Smith. Wizard Smith. <laughs> to Wizard Smith, ladies and gentlemen. Sadly, there aren't any photos or images of Wizard anywhere anymore, but at least he had a beer named after him, and I think most blokes would settle for that, don't you? It might be the pint of wizard talking, but something tells me this sleepy little place needs a bit of a shake-up. I might rouse the masses and kick out the convicts. I put out a call this morning for local people to help me recreate the story of the battle against transportation in Tasmania. And as you can see, I'm slightly, excuse me, slightly embarrassed by the number of people who've turned up. Good afternoon. Hi, 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 hi. Right, the, it's round about 1848. Thank you very much for coming, by the way. Um, I am the Reverend John West. You are the good people of Launceston, hopefully about to be stirred by my address to you. The time has arrived when one concerted, unanimous and distinct declaration should be sent forth that the inhabitants of Australia will cease to recognise anyone landing on its extensive shores as a criminal. Here, yeah. yeah, yeah, yes, keep on saying it here while I turn the pages over. Yeah, 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 yeah. We appeal to Australians, not just on behalf of the adult population, but of the 300,000 youth to fill the public offices. Yeah. And the sympathies of Englishmen will be won. Shall we take our course to the people? Yeah! I said, shall we take our course to the people? Yeah! We will show the people the light. No more, no more transportation. I don't know if my oratory skills match the Reverend John West's, but if he managed to pull half the crowd I have, it's no wonder his campaign to end transportation in Tasmania was such a success. What do we want? <laughs> when did we get it? <laughs> Ironically, West's campaign to stop the convicts also removed a great deal of Tasmania's workforce. But, hey, you can't win them all. There's one more thing that I wanted to show you that's very central to this story. Flag bearers! <laughs> you didn't unfurl your flag, did you? Why not? Oh, I think it might have got blown away in all that wind. I think you're probably right. Let's have it's a look at big. it. pretty big. Now, this isn't the first time that anyone invented a flag of Australia, is it? Tell no. us about it, John. Well, this, uh, the, uh, the original version of this flag, which had four stars on it to yeah. represent, the, represent the four colonies involved with the, uh, with the movement, was designed in Launceston by John West and sewn by members of his congregation. Now, they took this to Melbourne to the 1851 conference where they formed the Australasian League formally. And while there, the uh, people in Melbourne actually made this version yeah. with the fifth star to represent the addition of New Zealand to the league. Which they brought back here. Which they brought back here. So this is actually the first flag of Australia with all the constituent parts, the blue, the, the little Union Jack in the corner and the stars that was ever created. And That's right. It was created here by John West. Yes. Well, thank you for showing it to us. I've said it before and I'll say it again. On a walk like this, don't just look straight ahead. Remember to look up. If you do, you'll be rewarded with this. Beautifully preserved 19th century architecture the 70s developers didn't get their greedy mitts on. 
and most of it was the work of a family-owned building company called Guns. So what was so special about Guns? What made it so different? They were way ahead of their time. You could walk through the front door of their office here in Brisbane Street and if you had the title to a block of land, you could hand it over and they would build you a house on it. They employed architects. Uh, they employed all the trades skills you needed, so plumbers, electricians, uh, painters, carpenters, joiners. Because it, it's funny, I don't know much about guns, and forgive me if I'm offending you, but I think of them as agents of the devil, the, the, the spawn of Satan. From the 1980s onwards, they seemed to do everything to hack people off. Well, the company was turned from a family business into a public company. Public so it's not your fault? No, it's not my fault. Um, in the mid-1980s, the company was dogged by poor management decisions. They went into wood chipping in a big way, and then, and then the ultimate one was, of course, wanting to build the pulp mill. The controversial pulp mill turned the people's company into the people's enemy. Then the political wind shifted and eventually the money dried up. Guns had shot itself in the foot and eventually died a painful corporate death. This is a beautiful town now, isn't it? It is a beautiful town. I think more people should appreciate its beauty. And you must be proud that so many of your family's buildings are still here. Very proud. I mean, it's, I think it's sad that perhaps the legacy of guns that they left originally has been washed over by the legacy of what happened over the pulp mill. Yeah, but you're still here. I am. To tell people what really happened. Cheers, mate. Thank you, Tony. Very nice to meet you. You know, I think William Collins was spot on when he raved about Lonnie's unsurpassed beauty back in 1804. What's not to love about this place? Well, one thing, actually. I've got a confession to make. I'm really struggling with the pronunciation of this town. Sometimes I've been calling it Launceston, sometimes Lanceston, once Launceston. And the reason is this. I come from the southwest of England, and down our way, there's a little town in the county of Cornwall, just like this one used to be, by the banks of the Tamar, like this one is. It's got the same name as this one. In fact, this one is named after the Cornish one, but we pronounce the Cornish one, Lanston. And I can't get that out of my head, but I will keep trying, I promise you. Launceston, right? Launceston, 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 Launceston. 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 Oh, sorry. Look, look. Come over here, see this? Look. Historic bookshop. Knowledge, art and culture have been disseminated, what a good word that is, from this site since 1844. This is the oldest bookshop in Australia. Not only that, in here was invented something which transformed all of our lives. Something so out of the box, so left field, so radical, that the leading stationary manufacturer of its time called it outrageous and rejected it out of hand. What is it? The Silver City Writing Tablet. You're still having a clue, have you? Come on. The tablet was invented right here in the year 1902. And believe it or not, they're still selling them over 100 years later. If I can find them, that is. Yes! Got them. Now I've just got to flog them, haven't I? All right, I'll just leave those there for the moment. Excuse me. Would you like to buy a Silver City writing tablet? Uh, no. What is it? You don't know what it is, but you're still rejecting it out of hand. <laughs> Hang on, and I'll show you. Excuse me. Would you like to buy a Silver City writing tablet? I don't know what it is. No, I've got no idea. Come on. 
Do you know what a Silver City writing tablet is? Uh, no, I don't. OK, well, look, the year is 1902. If we want to write a letter, uh, if we want to make a list, we have to go into this shop, buy an individual piece of paper, or two, or four, or a choir, which is 24, all folded up neatly and put in a box. But that's incredibly unwieldy, isn't it? And it was here, in this very building, that the transformation occurred. I will show you the Silver City writing tablet. Here they are. These are pieces of paper with a long blodge of glue all the way along the top. The writing pad. This is a piece of your history. You can take it, you can hold it, you can own it, you can buy it for just two bucks. How about you? You can have one? Um, I'm not sold, sorry. You're not sold? The most iconic thing in the whole of Tasmania and you don't want one? <laughs> Flipping Launceston. <laughs> Come on. Did you hear that? Launceston. It might have taken me the best part of a day, but I got it right. Whatever the correct pronunciation, this is a beautiful city with fascinating history, great architecture, and people so friendly and so potty that they've been prepared to come out on the streets in their hundreds to help me recreate their history. So, to them, Thank you very much. Sorry about the pronunciation. And up the hawks, at least until I go a bit further south. Hi, I'm Tony Robinson. If you love my show and want to see some more amazing history stories, then please hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell, and we'll let you know when there's something new to watch. Enjoy.